good evening everyone my name is dr vishal soni i am a consultant laparoscopic surgeon based out of ahmedabad gujarat uh, i welcome everyone for the master class on rare abdomen wall hernias that we have gathered today to learn and understand more about uh, i welcome all the speakers the chairperson the delegates and all the viewers that are joining us live and who will be viewing us on the various channels later on i would like to uh, welcome dr ramesh agrawala the president of hernia society of india and i would want to uh, i would want him to start uh, the session with few kind words from his end uh, dr ramesh sir over to you thank you very much vishal i will on behalf of hernia society of india i welcome all the faculty in the daniel uh, dani emil you so Uh, Siddharth, Vijay Mittal, Atul, Harmeet, Ganesh, Pallavi. I'm sorry, she is not there. Parthi Sarthi, Rajesh Kullar. All of you all, I welcome all of you all to this uh, webinar. Pallavi was supposed to uh, moderate this session. She was supposed to be there, but uh, she had a, uh, uncle passed away yesterday, so she has gone there. So I, I, we are all going to miss her. the hernia society of india is very active and we have lot of educational programs it, it is a very vibrant society in india and the whole focus is to educate and propagate the art and science of hernia so we request all of us to join us uh, join the hernia society of india and be a part of this teaching and training now without much delay i would ask vishal to take forward the proceedings thank you thank you sir for the kind words uh i would be starting the session with uh my views and thoughts on uh femoral hernia that would be my topic for the day uh again allow me to introduce myself i am a consultant surgeon based out of zaidus hospital amdabad and in the next few slides we would uh, talk and discuss more about this topic that we have on the screen the incidence of femoral hernia is in the range of 2 to 4% that is when clinically they are operated it's likely to be uh, different in population but this is what the surgeon comes across we definitely know for sure that females have more incidence as compared to the males but even then the commonest groin hernias in females still remain inguinal hernias but when it comes to femoral the incidence is about four times more commonly seen as compared to the male counterparts the cause of the femoral hernias and more commonly in female would be in part due to multiparity anatomical uh, issues like narrow insertion of the ipt into the bacterial line along with it all the condition that cause increased intra abdominal pressures or pelvic floor weaknesses do contribute to the occurrences another point to be kept in mind is post weight loss status this is when the patients come in uh, obstruction with no apparent hernias to be seen moving over to the anatomy of the area under consideration the femoral canal is a potential space that is bound anteriorly or the superior aspect by the inguinal ligament the posteriorly by the pectineus on the lateral aspect we see the femoral vein and the medial border is formed by the lacunar ligament mind you this is a potential space which then has a tendency to open up and the hernia getting developed the importance of this this anatomy not only lies in how the hernia happens but also during the surgical manipulation and the surgical approaches we'll see that shortly in the slides to come according to the space from which the hernia starts and propagates we have various eponymous hernias when the initiation is through the lacunar ligament we have the logis hernia when the hernia occurs behind the femoral vessels we call it the serophemy when it happens in front we have teals when it happens to the pectineal fascia the clockwise hernia laterally when it happens lateral to the femoral artery it will become the hasselbacks and when it happens behind the femoral artery as in case of congenital hip dislocation of hip it's called a narrowed hernia now this is a view that is of utmost importance to the minimally invasive surgeon this is the posterior view where various structure can very clearly be seen uh 
we start from the rectus muscle, which is seen in the left side of the screen here, which gets inserted into the pubic bone. We have the lacunal ligament, as I just showed you in a few slides back, in the, which is the medial part of the femoral canal. This is the potential space which we talk about as the femoral canal. On the lateral aspect, we have the vessels. In this particular image, we have the accessory obturator seen. Uh, moving on further, we have the vas in front of us. We have the spermatic vessels seen. The iliopubic tract would be across the screen. And at 12 o'clock positions here, we have the inferior epigastrix. We'll talk more about the relevant anatomy and how it affects the decision making in further slides to come. Uh, there is this very beautiful paper by Maslow and uh, the team, which gives a concept of an inverted Y and has divided the whole anatomy into uh, five triangles. Based on defined anatomical landmarks, there are five triangles defined. So the upper limb superiorly, which is formed by the inferior epigastric vessels. Horizontally, we have the iliopubic tract. Medially and inferiorly, we have the vas. Medial, uh, inferiorly and laterally, we have the spermatic vessels. Accordingly, to go from uh, anti-clockwise, we have the triangle bound by the inferior epigastrix, the lateral border of the rectus muscle, and the iliopubic tract. This is where the direct hernias are seated, and this is where they propagate. Inferiorly, we have what can be called as a femoral triangle, denoted by the capital letter F, where the femoral hernias are seen. Bounded by the spermatics and the vas is what is called as an area of danger, doom, or death. The, we find the iliac vessels sitting at the floor. Between the iliopubic tract laterally and the spermatic vessels, is the triangle of pain. The importance is that any fixation done in this area would lead rise to a lot of pain. Uh, strictly speaking, the triangle of pain has a small extension superiorly by about two centimeters. I'll be mentioning the same in a couple of slides to come. This is the relevant anatomy that every minimally invasive surgeon should be very well versed with when it comes to identification of hernia, placement of the appropriate size of mesh, and the fixation of the mesh. This is the view that is seen when a laparoscope is introduced and all the anatomical landmarks that we just mentioned become very clear. Add on to what I just mentioned is the umbilical ligament here, the obliterated umbilical artery that is seen. That is the medial most uh, margin from where the peritoneum division starts usually. And this is an overlap of all the triangles with an inverted Y that I just mentioned. We have the pubic symphysis as the medial most end, the ilia crest, which is the lateral most end, and the various letters denote what happens uh, in that triangle. I would be for the indirect hernias, D would be for the direct hernias, F is for femorals, and the pain is for the occurrence of pain if there is fixation done in that particular quadrant and the red triangle is where if at all there is any manipulation or fixation done it can lead rise to torrential bleeding. This is the interesting uh, finding mentioned in the paper by Reinpold that I was mentioning about where they study the anatomical variations of all the nerves that we are talking about uh, the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve, and then they realized that the entry exits are way above the iliopubic tract, and therefore, not only the IPT, but even about two centimeters above the same, there should not be any fixations done. And that can be called as an extension of the pain triangle. This slide shows the uh, surgical approach that one can take when they are operating uh, the patient for groin hernia per se, where the step one would be dissection in the lateral area, followed by step two, which would be dissection more in the medial area. 
Step three would be the pyramid dissection, the central area. What is shown is the structures that are to be taken care of in the particular area. So lateral, we would be very careful regarding the nerves present. In the medial area, we would want to define the pubic, uh, the pubic tuberculum, the ligament, and the section of the hernial sac would happen. The central area is where the peritoneum is densely adhered, uh, especially in case of indirect in my hernia. And it's, uh, it also has uh, the um, adhesions with the vas difference and the vessels. So the dissection needs to be very careful. This is the picture once the dissection of the peritoneum is completed. The blue line represents the line above which the uh, fixation should happen. The red line is where the inferior epigastrics are seen. And this is the triangle of doom that one should be very careful of and should be away from. Uh, this is my way of uh, training and teaching my associates uh, of uh, having maybe a funny thing to remember or a better recall that beak is where the lacunas is and the head or the eye is where the femorals happen. So we have to make sure in each and every patient that the eye of the bird has been seen, has been noted and we made sure that the femoral hernia was taken care of even while we are doing uh, an inguinal hernia. Moving on to the next portion, that will be the diagnosis part. Uh, diagnosis not only starts with the clinical examination, but it starts from the thought of an experienced mind of a carefully uh, evaluated patient where you suspect that this patient might have a femoral hernia. The first step essentially would be a clinical examination. The usual way in which it is mentioned is that the femorals would start below and lateral to the pubic tubercle and the indirect inguinal would be above and medial, although the dictum holds true in small hernias also, but this should not be relied upon totally. We'll see why. As clinical evaluation alone can miss a lot of hernias, especially when they are small and more so in obese, when patients have a big uh, pad of fat in the pubic region or in the groin area. Also, when there are multiple hernias seen, the most obvious one would be picked up, but the other ones might be missed. Challenging hernia diagnosis, the ones like in femoral or clinically occult hernias should be further evaluated and that happens with using imaging modalities, which we'll be further talking about. Luckily, groin has a lot of well-defined anatomical landmarks, which includes muscles, vessels, and bony landmarks, using which we can very precisely diagnose which type of hernia we're dealing with uh, using the modalities of ultrasound and CT scan. What you can see on the screen on the left-hand side is the open groin here. I represents the iliacus muscle. T is the tendon of the psoas. P is the pectineus. L is the lacunar ligament and F is the potential femoral canal space. The blue represents the femoral vein and the red is the femoral artery. On the right hand side are the various hernias we just talked about a few slides ago. Coming further to the basic most radiological modality, the ultrasound. Uh, femoral vein is one of the most important anatomical landmarks to be kept in mind while diagnosing and while differentiating a femoral hernia from that of an inguinal. None of the inguinal hernias would ever have a compression of the femoral vein and this one aspect is utilized to differentiate that from the femoral hernia. On the left hand side image we have a femoral vein, lateral to which would be the femoral artery. On the right hand side of the screen, here we have a large femoral hernia, lateral to which is the femoral vein. Although an obvious compression is not seen, but femoral hernias tend to compress the femoral vein. Moving on to the further modality that is CT scan of the abdomen, here the femoral vein compression is seen very beautifully. The femoral hernia coming out of the femoral canal and since it's a tight space, would give rise to some pressure on the femoral vein, which is adjacent to it. On the right hand side is the coronal view, showing the bowel loop, 
which have got herniated into the groin using the femoral canal and as compared to the opposite side we see that there is presence of a well defined hernia on the right hand side this ct shows a very interesting although a rare finding that is presence of an appendix with some free fluid in the hernia this is the gangrot hernia and uh, again ct scan would be the modality of choice to diagnose and uh, to make sure that such a hernia is not missed or a surprise is not found when the patient is taken up for a surgery this is a ct scan showing a femoral hernia on the left hand side this is the femoral hernia that we just be seeing we can see the relation with the vessels here again a coronal thing for the same so originating below the iliopubic tract and this is where there is some subtle ballooning also seen of the femoral vein uh the video was shared by dr sumanta de a very good friend and thanks a lot to him for the same coming further to the treatment part uh femoral hernias need surgery a blanket statement can be given and it is very clear early elective surgery is the recommendation when compared to elective repair when you wait and these patients comp when they complicate and they will complicate it is associated with a greater risk of bowel resection and a longer hospital length of stay as we see in a hernia search paper uh there is a tendency that if the tissue repairs are done in the patient can be taken care of but mind you they these patients would tend to have a higher recurrence rate as compared to the mesh repair and therefore mesh use is recommended especially when not contraindicated when the field is not contaminated a, a stronger uh, statement coming up would be that laparoscopic surgery is recommended especially when the expertise is available and there are no strong contraindications Hello. the data is there to support that there is significantly less recurrence the post op pain is less as compared to the anterior approach and it provides an opportunity to identify all the other hernias and even the contralateral sites can be examined in the same go the if at all uh, an anterior approach has to be used uh, it would be better if a preperitoneal open mesh plasty is used by the covid 19 infection cases in the, the recovery rate of over 100% has been achieved uh, in the last a better month. repair and lesser complications as seen by fewer recurrences and uh, lesser post operative foreign body sensations as compared to an anterior mesh to uh, further uh, give information on the same we have three approaches mentioned in the open the classic ones uh, the lothesine trans inguinal approach the lockwood infra inguinal approach and the mckeeves high approach uh, the incisions are meant as uh, i have shown in the diagram on the left hand side the concept would be to identify the femoral hernia to close the femoral ring we may or may not add a plug as the surgeon might desire these are the operative images this one particular shows lothesine's repair where the inguinal exploration has been done the posterior wall has been opened and we've seen the presence of a femoral hernia which is then reduced the sac is opened the sac is then excised closed and the tissue repair has been shown here moving on to the the better probably repair and that is the laparoscopic i personally prefer tap surgery so i'll be talking about tap mesh plasties on the left hand side is the uh, surgeon and the assistant placements so the camera and the uh, the work station comes on the side of the hernia and the surgeon stands on the opposite side of the hernia the port placement would depend on how the instruments uh, and the triangulation is being conducted by the surgeon 
So in the routine, uh, what I would also follow would be that there'll be a triangulation of the instrument. The camera port would come in the center and both the working instruments would come on the opposite side as shown in the image here. We may also use ipsilateral ports whereby the camera would be placed on one side and both the instruments are on either side. So it can be horizontally placed, it can be vertically placed. So these are the port placements, especially when it comes to bilateral DAP mesh plasty. So the camera would come in the center and both the ports, five millimeter ports would come a little lower down, placed symmetrically. But when we are operating a unilateral hernia, the port on the side of the hernia can be a little higher up and the port on the opposite side of the hernia can be placed a little lower down for a better triangulation and for better ergonomics. Here is a video shared by Dr. Sarfaraz Beg showing a tap mesh plasty done for a femoral hernia. So we can see the femoral hernia in this aspect here. He is now opening the peritoneum. It should be done about three centimeters above the superior extent. Gentle traction, counter traction is the key for correct and beautiful dissection. The medial limit would be the medial umbilical ligament. The correct space would be the preperitoneal space. And what he just divides gives a small subtle hint towards the bilamellar structure of the transversalis fascia. He further goes down and does the medial dissection to see the lighthouse. Thin strands of the preperitoneal space are then divided. If the plane is correct, then all these can be done very beautifully with a scissor with minimal use of energy devices. And here is where he's operating at the pyramid. We expect little adhesions in this area, the long standing the hernia is, the denser the adhesions would be. And in this particular patient, since it's a female patient, we'll come across a round ligament. That's dissection at the ring. And shortly we'll see the femoral hernia. Yes. So he put his instrument in the femoral hernia from the peritoneal side. He'll define the round ligament. That's the round ligament that has been dissected. And now it has been divided. Fat would be then cleared. We will shortly see the nicely dissected femoral canal. Adequate space has to be created to place a correct size mesh. This is the pubic bone, the lacrimal ligament and the inferior epigastric artery. And this left instrument now goes into the femoral defect. Over here also we do see an accessory obturator vessel. FR is the femoral ring. Very beautifully seen.
the peritoneal opening is then closed that is where the femoral hernia was so as you can see he is using ipsilateral instrument through ports placed ipsilaterally the mesh goes in the mesh is fixed at the bone the suture is cut and it is unrolled to cover all the other sides of the potential sites of hernia another fixation done and this would be closure of the peritoneum it's done in running suture fashion and we can see that he can operate from both hands very beautiful video uh another very beautiful uh letter to uh, the editor uh, where orgedice mentions nine steps to critical view of uh, for the myopectineal orifice how to go in a very calculated and methodic way in which the dissection can be carried out for performance of safe surgeries and to detect even the occult most hernias to summarize uh, we should look for uh, these hernias in all female patients specifically definition of the myopectineal orifice in all the anatomical landmarks is important to perform the surgery safely and uh, correctly groin pain evaluation this is how the patients present to us especially with small hernias need a dynamic imaging like ultrasound or a ct scan acquaintance with lab anatomy and imaging modalities is very important and it is the way ahead there will be no wait and watch as we do or as we might do in case of inguinal hernia and all these patients would need surgical intervention because of high incidence of complication when the femoral hernias are conserved and laparoendoscopic treatment is the preferred one minimally invasive surgery can be offered even in complicated cases even when patients present with obstruction or so on and so forth thank you thank you very much dr vishal for that very wonderful illustrative talk i now request the chairperson dr siddharth tamaskar a senior consultant surgeon in the department of minimal access surgery and ja surgery shri ramakrishna care hospital raipur and an executive committee member of hsi to just give us comments and uh, any questions to be addressed to dr vishal please yeah first of all vishal uh, thank you for that excellent presentation and uh, that elaborate anatomical depiction it was really a wonderful uh, lecture to watch and uh, i think uh, femoral hernia is uh, one of the more difficult cases of hernias where you uh, have to tackle in these patients mostly they are missed and uh, usually in uh, what our experience is that you usually find it in accordance with the associated hernias like obturator hernias yes. and inguinal hernias as such yes so another one or two things which uh, of course uh, i would just uh, like to add on uh, like because i also prefer to do a, i am a tapp surgeon basically so the other point uh, regarding is when the mesh placement because i am talking about the laparoscopic hernia repair is that we prefer to uh, the mesh to be more medially placed in uh, uh, femoral hernias if if you are tackling a femoral hernia as such and then at least a 3 cm overlap sometimes what happens is because the width of the mesh is limited to 15 cm it may be a, it may be a scenario where you are pulling the mesh medially and then you find that you don't have a proper lateral overlap and 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 in a few cases they have landed up putting in another mesh to cover up the inguinal part so uh, what 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 is the take home message is that the whole myopectineal orifice has to be covered sufficiently at least 3 cm of overlap is what is important and you have to go down below and in femoral hernias associated obturator hernias is a common in our experience 
so that area is also to be tackled of course we have going to have a elaborate presentation on obturator hernia just coming up and those are the take home points and uh, uh, i just welcome any other questions which i have i don't see any questions in the chat right you want to make any other comments vishal no so i i guess that that will be true. regarding the obturator as i yeah, as you rightly mentioned we have a talk coming up and that is where i left the i i would rather leave the the topic yes. to dr okay. ganesh uh dr ganesh uh, shinoy uh, i guess it will be over to you for obturator hernia and dr vijay mittal he'll be chairing the session so welcome dr mittal welcome dr gershinoy uh, over to you so i'll start sir please go ahead sir sir please go ahead yeah uh, good evening everybody uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, hsi uh, the hagnia society of india our president dr ramesh agrawal and all our executive committee members for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak on this uh, one of the rarest abnormal wall hernias uh, that is up to up to at hernias vishal had a wonderful presentation regarding the femoral hernias so i would like to talk on i been given an opportunity to speak on this obturator hernias <clears throat> so now what is it what is an obturator hernia so by definition the obturator hernia is the protrusion of either an intraperitoneal or an extraperitoneal organ so intraperitoneal may be a small bowel loops or maybe a colon or an extraperitoneal organ or a tissue through the obturator canal so this obturator canal is normally 2 to 3 cm long and it is 1 cm wide it is a triangular normally contains obturator nerve and vessels and obturator foramen is supposed to be the largest foramen in the body so by definition it is either a protrusion of intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal organ or tissue through the obturator canal so <clears throat> by laparoscopic approach how to define by laparoscopic approach with the advent of this minimal access surgery the incidence or the rate of detection of obturator hernias have increased so which was so earlier called as an occult hernias have increased in incidence or the rate of detection uh, because of this uh, minimal access procedures so by laparoscopic approach there is a definition uh, which to call as an obturator her uh, hernia that is <coughs> excuse me either the obturator foramen has to be wide it is a wide obturator foramen through which there is herniation of peritoneal sac or a lipoma or a fatty plug which has originated in the preperitoneal or a paravesical or the para bladder urinary bladder fat tissue so the herniation of the peritoneal sac or the contents intraabdominal contents or a extra peritoneal a fat or a paravesical fat is considered as an obturator hernia through the wide obturator foramen initially all the obturator hernias starts with the preperitoneal fat herniation forming a fat plug then finally it draws draws in the peritoneum forming a peritoneal sac then the intraabdominal contents uh, leading to symptoms of uh, pain or obstruction so how rare are obturator hernias it was first described by arnold de ramsel in 1724 so obturator hernia is one of the rarest hernias with incidence being 0.073% of all the hernias it is slightly higher in the asian population about 1.6% it is more common in females compared to male counterpart uh, the reasons being the broader pelvis larger obturator canal in females and the larger obturator foramen the horizontal width of the triangle the triangular obturator foramen is wider in females maybe because of previous history of pregnancy the multiparous women tends to have a lax pelvic peritoneum the pelvic peritoneum tends to become lax so there is more chance of herniation of the peritoneum to the wide obturator foramen it's been also mentioned as a little old lady hernias the reason being this is more very common in older females more than 70 to 75 year old females as ages uh, there is uh, because of emaciation uh, there is loss of uh, preperitoneal fat and what we call as a corpus adipocem uh, which annul up uh, the obturator canal so this loss of uh, preperitoneal fat uh, which was enveloping the obturator canal a results in herniation of the intraabdominal or the extraperitoneal tissue uh, causing femoral causing the obturator hernias now obturator hernias according to literature are more common in the 
right side it is thought that uh, the sigmoid colon which is there on the left side normally blocks the aperta canal so the incidence is more on the right side bilaterally it has got incidence of 6% but one point to be noted is aperta hernias are found to have the highest mortality rate among all the abdominal wall hernias the reason being one it presents at the advanced age as called as a little old lady hernias this advanced age people may have associated comorbid conditions and the most commonly the highest mortality and morbidity rate are because of is delay in presentation diagnosis and the treatment because it rarely presents as a visible swelling rarely present as a palpable mass it is deep in location most of the times it is uh, detected by per rectal or uh, per vaginal examination the classical signs which are described like how how she rhombox sign are very very rare they are just present in 15 to 50% of the uh, individuals most of the aperta hernias they present with pain uh, middle side of the thigh radiating to the knee this is because the aperta nerve has got a geniculate branch which supplies the knee so whenever there is an aperta hernia to the aperta foramen where the nerve goes there is compression of this uh, geniculate branch of the aperta nerve uh, where the patient can just present with the pain so there might be a delay in diagnosis and the delay in treatment uh, normally 90% of the time this aperta hernias uh the present as features of intestinal obstruction so many a times it is unsuspected that whenever the patient present with intestinal obstruction we may not think of an obstructive hernia might be a cause for this obstruction so there might be a delay in uh, diagnosis so whenever there is a delay in treatment there are more chance that intestine may undergo ischemic changes uh, leading to uh, gangrene uh with the associated uh, uh, intestinal resection and anastomosis which, which may add to the mortality in uh, advanced age group so early ct scan can minimize the chances of interest can can increase the chance of detection of obturator hernia and minimize the chance of intestinal ischemia and mortality so now what are the approaches to be followed it can most of the times if the patient present with intestinal obstruction it will be a lower midline laparotomy which is most commonly followed and the first successful repair of the obturator hernia by open technique was performed by henry omre in way back in 1857 so whenever there is a midline the basic principle of uh, dealing with an uh, obturator hernia is a lower midline laparotomy then reduction of the contents then resection if there is an intestinal ischemia then the resection then the repair of the obturator hernia so if there is an intestinal ischemia or any gangrenous changes it is not advisable to place a mesh but to repair the obturator hernia defect Uh, you can repair in uh, many ways. Uh, many a times, the in the older literature and the recent literature also have mentioned uh, using the uh, surrounding tissues. For example, uh, maybe a periosteum of the pubic uh, uh, pubic symphysis, or a part of the urinary bladder, or the uterus, or the round ligament to plug the or a vascularized omentum to plug the obturator foramen, so that the chance of recurrence hernia is less. But in an elective case, the use of mesh is a must. so these are the procedures uh, utilizing the uterine fundus or the surrounding tissues like bladder or the round ligament they may distort the normal anatomy of the pelvis and also the introduction of the foreign uh, bodies for example uh, uh, a mental plug or uh, any other foreign bodies or a tantalum gauze which was mentioned earlier to plug the obturator foramen can compress the obturator nerve uh, leading to pain in the post operative uh, course so Uh, some tips for successful repair of uh, obturator hernia is the peritoneum has to be dissected well it has to be dissected well to expose the iliac vessels the reasons being it enables the insertion of a bigger mesh or the entire mesh to prevent rolling of its free border and it is very important we should not trim the mesh because if we don't trim the mesh there is a greater surface area which is available uh, and it prevents the uh, possible displacement of the mesh before the fibroblast can uh, infiltrate the interstices of the mesh and medially the mesh has to be fixed to the pubic tubercle and the fascia over the symphysis pubis so these precautions if you have taken even in a laparoscopic repair are said to reduce the incidence of uh, recurrence in an obturator hernias so i would like to go uh, show you some of the video clips of obturator hernias uh, this is a young adult male who presented with the large left inguinal scrotal hernia so it was a large inguinal scrotal hernia we select cases for etp mesh repair uh, only uh, patients who have large inguinal scrotal hernias so this was a large indirect sac which are lateral to the infraepigastric vessels 
a high index of suspicion is required to diagnose these occult obturator hernias. So as the space of regius is dissected or the cave of regius is dissected, once you laterally, you can see some peritoneal fat which is protruding into the obturator foramen. So by laparoscopy, by definition wise, any intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal tissue or organ which protrudes into the obturator foramen is considered an obturator hernia. So there you can see there, as we go lateral to the space of red gears, we can see a suspicious fat uh, protruding into the obturator canal. So this patient didn't have any symptoms of uh, obturator hernia, maybe a pain to the knee or any other things which are mentioned in the literature or in the books. But this was uh, instantly detected because of high index of suspicion. So whenever you dissect the entire myoprectinal orifice of Richard and see a fat plug uh, below the uh, pubic symphysis, lateral to the bladder, then a suspicion of obturator hernia has to be. So you can see there that the fat plug, preparatinal fat herniating into the obturator foramen, a bipolar triathermy acts well uh, in this situation to maintain hemostasis. That's the fat, preparatinal fat, which was herniated into the obturator foramen. You can see the obturator foramen there. That's the symphysis pubis. So you can see the obturator nerve, the obturator artery, which are normal contents of the obturator canal. So whatever the preparatinal fat which was herniated has been reduced. And it has to be ensured that the entire content needs to be reduced for the placement of a large mesh without any rolling. So this is a case of obturator hernia, which was dissected during a TEP. So that's the left TEP mesh repair being done. The entire space of red was dissected. And you can see again, that the yellow uh, marker, that's the fat, again, herniating into the obturator uh, foramen. So you have to be very meticulous because here for reduction, you can't give an external pressure. So you have to be very meticulous because there are obturator nerve obturator artery and obturators are vein there. Take care not to damage those structures. So a gentle traction uh, is a utmost is of utmost importance in the reduction of these contents. There you can see there a quite a bit of extrapetal fat was herniating into the obturator foramen. That's the pectineus muzzle down. That's the obturator artery entering the obturator foramen. So intermittent use of bipolar diathermy to maintain the hemostasis helps to maintain a clean field. So all the fat which was herniated need to be reduced. Otherwise, uh, you may still find some of the fat herniating behind the mesh, uh, resulting in recurrence of the hernia because you're not going to fix the mesh inferiorly. That's the obturator vein. You can see the pulsations of the obturator artery there. So all the fat has been reduced. And the obturator foramen is free of any contents now. That's the obturator nerve. And that, that's the Cooper's ligament. So they just to show that it will be below the Cooper's ligament. And as you go dissecting lateral to the lateral in the space of red gears, you may find a obturator hernia. So this again, uh, around a 60 year old male patient uh, planned for a TAP mesh repair for a inguinal hernia. That's a, uh, incidentally, we had all the four hernias. He had a direct hernia. He also had an indirect hernia. He had an femoral hernia and an obturator hernia also. So that's the direct hernia being reduced. That's the indirect sac there. So the indirect hernia reduced. And there was a suspicion because there was a preparatinal fat which was herniating in the femoral ring. Normally during a dissection, uh, we see that we also try to dissect the femoral uh, ring, not dissect as such, just to uh, go near the area of the femoral uh, ring and find if there is any preparatinal fat which is herniating, which was reduced. And here there was a suspicion of the fat going into the obturator foramen. So all the fat 
which is going into the upright of hormone is reduced. That's the upright of nerve there. So, as I mentioned, with the advent of laparoscopy, the incidence of these rare type of abdominal hernias have increased. So, this another case uh, taken as a femoral hernia. Uh, patient presented with the history of uh, irreducible femoral hernia. The CT scan was done. CT scan showed features of femoral hernia. Then, uh, since it was not reduced under general anesthesia, the patient was taken up for a TAPP mesh repair. The patient had previous history of scissor section with lower midline scar. That's the space of red CS dissection being done. So the content, which was a small bowel loop, was already reduced. That's the preperitoneal fat, which has herniated into the femoral canal. So the preperitoneal fat is reduced. This is the anatomy of the femoral canal, which I has already explained. So as you as the as you go below, that's the Cooper's ligament. So with a high index suspicion, as you go below the Cooper's ligament, you can see the preperitoneal fat along with the obturator nerve with a wide obturator foramen. So, the, so the, all the contents are reduced. There's a small obturator hernia there. So that's the entire myoperitoneal orifice being dissected. Now a large mesh, that's 13 into 15 centimeter polypropylene mesh is introduced, fixed to the Cooper's ligament. Then the people here, as you see, the lower part of the mesh is well plugged into the space of uh, radius, at least three centimeter into the space of radius, because there is no fixation is done inferiorly. So this uh, really prevents the recurrence of obturator hernia. Here you can see the pubic symphysis. This is the pubic symphysis. One tack is placed over the Cooper's ligament. This is the site of the obturator foramen, and this is the lower part of the mesh. Uh, at the same time, you have to take care that whenever you close the peritoneum, the mesh doesn't get lifted up. So raise a very good flap of the peritoneum, that is during its closure also, or during peritoneal uh, approximation, see that the mesh doesn't get lifted. So this is the site of the obturator for a month. You have, have enough of the mesh, at least three to four centimeter of the mesh below the obturator of a month. So this uh, prevents the recurrence rate of obturator hernias. So now the question is, is a routine exploration of the obturator space during a laparoscopic repair, let it be a TAPP mesh repair or a TP mesh repair, is it required? So there is a TP mesh repair being done on the right side, the space of radius is dissected. So there you can see the accessory obturator artery there over the Cooper's ligament. As you go laterally, dissecting the space of radius, the first structure normally what you see will be an obturator nerve. So be very gentle. There is no use of energy uh, sources here close to the obturator nerve. So those tissues, the flimsy tissues, you can use an intermittent diathermy. So that's the normal obturator space. You can you, you, you are not seeing any white obturator foramen or any fat herniating in this area. So that's the obturator now, there's the entire myoperitoneal orifice. So whenever you're placing the mesh here, see that it is the this peritoneum here is not herniating, uh, that peritoneum is not herniating behind the mesh. So there is one paper uh, which is searched uh, that the obturator hernia as a frequent finding during laparoscopic pelvic exploration. So this was a retro retrospective uh, study that was conducted in Israel uh, for five years, that is from 2003 to 2007. So here uh, they have looked out for or searched for an obturator hernia while they, where they are operating for uh, inguinal hernia in all cases. So the number of patients were 293 in five years who had bilateral or a recurrent inguinal hernia. The recurrent following, it was basically a recurrent following an open surgery. So 96% of the patients were male on contrary to the literature which shows that it is more common in female. 20 cases of obturator hernia was detected among 293, 18 was for bilateral and two for recurrent hernias. And also the average operating time with the patients is obturator hernia doesn't differ much from the average operating time. So there was no complications. The length of hospital stay was the same. So with this paper, we can conclude that the obturator foramen should be explored. This is to prevent the recurrence because of an occult obturator hernia or a missed hernia, what we can say. 
uh, following an invalid hernia repair and the true incidence of obturator hernia has increased because of the advent of uh, laparoscopic uh, procedures than reported in the literature if the obturator hernia is found let it be a preperitoneal fat as a content or a paravesical fat as a content or as a fat plug or a lipoma or you find a very wide obturator foramen it has to be repaired <coughs> using a mesh which is fixed well to the cooper's ligament and the pubic symphysis and see that enough of the mesh the flat mesh or the free end of the mesh is not rolled up and it is pushed well into the space of uh, radius or the cave of radius uh, thank you very much dr shinoy that was one beautiful presentation and some some very beautiful videos i must uh, congratulate you that was a very nicely shown talk um, it was in fact so nice that i i believe there are no questions dr mithal what would be your comment so you are you are muted dr mithal Dr. Mithil, you muted yourself. Yes, sir. Please, few words I, from your end. I would like to congratulate Dr. Ganesh and I on uh, tackling a very difficult hernia very very nicely, and ex explaining in detail the anatomy and the way to deal with it. Uh, I have I have one question. Is it necessary to pull out all the fat from? Femoral hernia and the obturator. Uh, I mean, femoral canal and the obturator canal. In all cases, or you will go after them only if you suspect a sac to be there. Ah, uh, sir. Uh, by laparoscopy, the definition is the any herniation of any extra peritoneal fat or a paravesical fat into the obturator foramen is considered as an obturator hernia. So most of the times, when we explore the obturator uh, area. routinely you don't see any fat herniating into the obturator foramen as i shown in the video there was no obturator fat when i explored the uh, showed the video of obturator space being explored routinely there mm -hmm. was no fat which was herniating into the obturator foramen so high index of suspicion is required when you start dissecting the space of radius go laterally if you find any fat which is herniating into the obturator foramen or you find an obturator foramen those uh, fat has to be reduced because once you place a mesh we are not going to fix the mesh inferiorly so this herniated fat uh, remains behind the mesh and this fat this fat may pull up the peritoneum in future it can draw in the peritoneum because of the increase intraabdominal pressure or any other causes it can draw the peritoneal sac and then in future the patient may not present with a visible swelling or we may not appreciate a palpable lump <coughs> but the patient may just present with pain so i feel that routinely obturator space has to be explored it doesn't take much time Uh, as you yeah, I mean, yeah. cases in place and any suspicion of fat herniating into the obturator foramen needs to be reduced because anyway you are covering it with the mesh the mesh covers the entire myopatal orifice of future so the chances of recurrence or the post operative uh, pain because of the missed or occult obturator hernias will be minimized okay good thank you Excellent. thank you very uh, much dr shinoy yes, any yes. more questions now there are no questions from the audience as such so i think so we can move to the next segment uh, we have a change in sequence here so uh, the topic of internal hernias uh, would be taken uh, prior to the other two topics so i invite uh, speaker dr rajesh kula sir and uh, i would uh, invite uh, dr yusuf ashwath to chair the session uh, dr rajesh sir over to you Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can see. <coughs> yes, sir. So we can see you very clearly. Okay. Can you see my slide? No, sir. Not yet. No, not yet.
can you see now so get yes we can yes. see your desktop now yeah you can see my desktop yes sir. yes you can open yes, we can see your desktop okay can you see the slide now yes sir yes yes yes, yes we can yeah can you see that yes 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 we can see yeah thank you very much uh, and i thank uh, dr ramesh agarwala for uh, arranging uh, these multiple series of hernias i thank uh, dr yusuf uh, good to see you there yes <laughs> and i bring greetings from uh, my max institute of laparoscopic endoscopic bariatric surgery center uh a very uh, unusual topic has been uh, allotted to me by dr ramesh agarwala i'll try to do my best justice to this now there are three types of hernias you can have uh, external hernias you can have diaphragmatic hernias and you can have internal hernias as such when hernias are concerned now external hernias are the hernias which occur through body wall they produce a visible palpable swelling which is covered by skin as you can see the different variety you can have epigastric incisional umbilical inguinal femoral uh, spigelian uh, you know different kind of hernias then you can have diaphragmatic hernia which can occur uh, as a diaphragmatic hernia or as a hiatus hernia the diaphragmatic hernias are congenital which could be through the foramen of morgagni which is anteriorly placed or it could be through foramen of bokdalek which is posteriorly placed on the right side the acquired diaphragmatic hernias are hiatus hernias and i think uh, uh, we are not going to discuss uh, these hiatus diaphragmatic hernia because they are a big topic in itself so what today we are going to discuss is the true in internal hernias now these internal hernias are invisible they are impalpable and they are not covered by skin by definition these uh, are the protrusions of abdominal viscera most commonly the small bowel through an intra abdominal aperture without traversing the facial planes so that is the main the important definition that you can't feel them they they are not visible to us and they happen internally now these internal hernias they usually present as bowel obstruction and they are the cause of bowel obstruction in approximately 0.6 to 5.8% of all small bowel obstructions but it is to be remembered that if it the obstruction is because of internal hernia it is associated to almost 31 to 50% mortality especially in acute events because the diagnosis is delayed in these cases now the internal hernias could occur through the natural defects or they could occur through acquired defects inside the abdomen now if you see the natural uh, the uh, you know uh, naturally occurring defects the internal hernia through natural defects they are rarely suspected pre operatively and normally most frequently they are diagnosed only intra operatively when you have gone in for relieving the obstruction now these naturally occurring hernias could be a paradudinal hernia which could be left paradudinal or right paradudinal now this is the left paradudinal and this will be the right paradudinal or it could be through the foramen of winslow hernia it could be a pericecal hernia around the cecum it could be a sigmoid mesocolon hernia related hernia it could be transmesenteric hernia or it could be transomental hernia or supravesical and pelvic hernias out of these hernias paradudinal hernias are the most common ones and they form almost 53% of all the natural occurring internal hernias 
and then comes the pericecal and then the other rare hernias so these hernias are really rare in occurrence and the symptomatology of these hernias depend upon the uh, individual region where they occur the problem is the diagnostic dilemma because they do not present with any specific symptoms the symptoms are vague and the examination is non contributory other than the evidence of small bowel obstruction the high index of suspicion and early ct can help in the diagnosis where you can see a u or c shaped distended intestinal loops now the symptoms depend whether you have a left paradeudinal hernia or a right paradeudinal hernia left paradeudinal hernia is more common and occurs in 75% of all paradeudinal hernias normally these hernias they occur because of defect in the rotation of gut when it is occurring and on the left side it is the congenital fossa of lenzert which occurs in 2% of patients at the duodeno jejunal junction behind the inferior mesenteric vein and these patients normally present as postprandial pain on the right side which is about 25% of all paradeudinal hernias this occurs through the waldeyer uh, fossa which is less than 1% behind the superior mesenteric artery superior mesenteric artery and this also gives it presents uh, and it it is behind the superior mesenteric artery and presents as chronic postprandial pain so in these patients basically you have to really have high suspicious uh, index of suspicion and get a ct scan done to diagnose uh, this condition the important thing to remember is that the mortality in these cases is very high due to delay in diagnosis and septic complication of bowel ischemia so that is why you have to act as quickly as possible the more important and common uh, entity which we see in internal hernia is through the acquired defect especially after the uh, much common laparoscopic bariatric surgery especially the bypass surgery these hernias used to be rare when this uh, obesity surgery was being performed by open technique because of the formation of intra abdominal adhesions after open surgery but since the advent of laparoscopic surgery when these techniques are done laparoscopically the intra abdominal adhesions are much much less and the bowel has much more chances to move around inside now there are three classical defects <clears throat> uh, one is the transverse mesocolon defect and this used to happen when a retrocolic anastomosis of gastrogeosnosme was done which is now done rarely because now we prefer to do a anticolic uh, gastrogeosnosme the <clears throat> the elementary limb comes in front of the colon so prevent any hole in the mesocolon to prevent a mesocolic defect and a mesocolic hernia so now we are faced usually with two defects which is one a jejuno jejunal defect jejuno jejunal mesenteric defect where you uh, create a jejuno jejunosme and second is the <clears throat> peterson defect where the defect is between the mesentery of the elementary limb and the transverse mesocolon so these two defects are developed in all cases of ru and y gastric bypass surgery laparoscopically done and <clears throat> it is important to close these defect at the time of surgery to prevent development of these hernia but even closure of these defect do not uh, prevent hernia formation now other procedure which can lead to acquired internal hernias are the bowel anastomosis done for resection anastomosis of the bowel even hepaticojejunosme done during a liver transplant and whipple procedure uh, creates internal hernial defects uh, ostomy formation also creates a uh, internal hernia so during all these procedures it is imperative that we close these 
defects to prevent development of internal hernia. So this is the classical RU and Y gastric bypass, and uh, these are the classical two defects through the jejunal-jejunal defect as well as uh, between the elementary uh, limb and transverse mesocolon. Now the incidence through these uh, defects after uh, LRYGB is about 1.8 to 7.6 percent and the herniation of long segment of bowel can occur and it can lead to catastrophic ischemia. Uh, we have seen uh, almost all the bowel herniating through these defects and going one 360 or even double twisting to cause ischemia of the whole gut. Now, these patients, they present with the postprandial abdominal pain, symptoms of obstruction. Uh, the important thing to understand is that if a patient of post uh, Roux and Y gastric bypass has lost significant amount of weight and comes with abdominal pain, there are two things to be ruled out. One is a uh, anastomotic ulcer and second would be internal hernia. So one must always, always suspect. suspect. So uh, the high index of suspicion is the most important thing uh, in diagnosing these patients. So uh, even if the patient, these patients may not have uh, actual symptom of obstruction, uh, especially if the herniation is through the uh, Peterson defect, the patient may continue. There may, be, may not be any dilatation of the loop. There may not be any complete obstruction, but still there may be internal hernia. And it is important to intervene when these patients are having pain rather than waiting for them to come to emergency. Because once they come in emergency, then uh, if the obstruction continues and if exploration is delayed, the effect may be very catastrophic. Now the diagnosis, uh, if you suspect pain and if you have suspicion of internal hernia, CECT is the gold standard. Uh, so we must do it. Although even after doing CT, about 20% cases, the diagnosis can be missed on CT also. So if you have a very strong suspicion, doing a diagnostic laparoscopy will always be a good uh, decision to go in. Uh, mesenteric wall sign is seen only in about 55% of patients who have uh, internal hernia. So you must not depend on that. Once you go in, if patient comes as an emergency, you have to go in as early as possible because there may be a closed loop obstruction. And this leads to rapid evolution to strangulation and ischemia. During surgery, you have to reduce the bowel as safely as possible because usually bowel is distended, especially if you have gone in acute case. You may injure the bowel, so you have to be very, very careful. So you reduce the bowel, bring back the circulation, and always close the defect always inspect if you have herniation through one defect, always look at the other defect also and close that if it is patent. Overall mortality, if the patient presents in acute stage, may be as high as 50%. Now, this is a video of a patient who had chronic pain abdomen. Uh, he was scoped electively on a suspicion and you can see it's a jejunal jejunal herniation. The bowel loop has herniated through the jejunal jejunal defect. And you can reduce the bowel. You will see when the whole uh, bowel comes out, even the JJ anastomosis can herniate. And once you reduce, the obstruction is relieved in front of you. This is the best way to do it at this stage. So if you have suspicion clinically that the patient is having pain of postprandial pain and there is significant loss of weight, this is the best time to go in, reduce the hernia, 
and close the defect. But it doesn't happen. Always the patient may come in this stage. Now, this is the bowel is in pregangrenous state. You can see that the bowel is glowish, but not totally gangrenous. Uh, this is the herniation through the Peterson defect. You have to handle the bowel very carefully. And one of the way is to start from the ileocecal junction. You can see the cecum. That's the ileocecal junction. Start pulling the bowel from the ileocecal junction. Go on proximally. And you most of the you can see the collapsed bowel which you are pulling. So gradually, as you go towards the herniation, it becomes dilated. And that is how you bring out the loop through the defect. And that's the JJ, and it has been reduced. And that's the defect through which the bowel had gone. This is the Peterson defect. You can see the transverse mesocolon above. That's the transverse colon. It is important to close this defect with non absorbable suture and continuous suture to make sure that there is no further herniation. And it is very, very important. Although in primary surgery, if you close all the defects, still herniation can occur after the patient undergoes loss of weight because the spaces can open up again. But definitely closure at that time. And now you can see the bowel has regained its viability. The color has come back. So we have saved this bowel from turning into a gangrene. But sometimes you can be very unlucky. And when you go in, you may come across this state. This patient came about five days after the symptoms. There was no way this bowel could be salvaged. So it was opened up. We uh, excised the bowel, reversed the anastomosis by doing a gastrogastrostomy. Luckily, this patient had about uh, half a meter of uh, bowel from the DJ and about uh, one and a half meter from the ileocecal junction and we could anastomose and salvage him. But look at the amount of massive bowel resection which needed to be done to save this patient and it is important to reverse the bypass whenever you do a massive resection because that itself will maintain the weight of the patient. So important thing to keep in mind is that you should always carefully uh, close all the mesenteric defects during laparoscopic RYGV. The internal hernias are rare hernias, and these hernias are difficult to diagnose. A high, of, high index of suspicion is always very, very necessary. And prompt surgical intervention is very important to save these patients. This condition is associated with high morbidity and mortality due to bowel ischemia and necrosis. So one must act quickly in these cases. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Uh, I can not see any question in the chat box. Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, even from the doc texts, there are no questions as such. So, uh, Dr. Rajesh, that was a very comprehensive and very nice presentation. Uh, the videos were very nice. I'm Thank sure you very uh, much. Thank those you. those question I want should to... have been very challenging when you see such an abdomen. Uh, yeah. doc, Dr. Yusuf, you you have any comments yeah, yeah. on the same? Please, go ahead. Sir, the studies have shown that uh, Peterson uh, hernia is more common than jejunal jejunal hernia. So, what's your experience among yeah, you see what happens is uh, if you do not, there was a school of thought and there are still two surgeons now who would say that uh, whether you close or you don't close, the internal hernia can occur. So if you don't close uh, any of the hernias, then you have more common herniation through Peterson defect. Uh, if you close uh, jejuno jejunal hernia, uh, then again, you know, uh, Peterson defect will happen. We were initially, we found when we started doing uh, laparoscopic bypass, we also thought that, uh, you know, closing will not make any difference. 
and we took the easy path and not closing the defects and after two years of our starting doing bypass we started getting jejunal jejunal uh, internal herniations and then we started closing our jejunal jejunal defect and after two years of that we started getting peterson hernia herniations so it is imperative to close both the hernias both the hernial defects to prevent or if not prevent to reduce the incidence of internal hernia in these patients and sir uh, in patients who have normal ct scan and symptoms of chronic obstruction or chronic recurrent obstruction uh, you go by diagnostic laparoscopy yeah you see if the patient of uh, rygb comes with pain abdomen recurrent pain abdomen one is to rule out as i said a uh, ulcer you know ulcer at the gastrojejunosme uh, so if once the ulcer is ruled out uh, if you do a ct you see the ct has to be done during pain only then you may see uh, features of internal herniation because many of these patients they will have herniation bowel will herniate and then come back to normal situation so if the patient doesn't have any pain at the time of ct scan the ct scan may be absolutely normal the chances of picking up features of uh, internal hernia on ct would be more if the ct scan is done during acute pain uh, if that also doesn't show and you rule out a uh, pain due to gallstone disease you rule out pain due to ulcer uh, then only thing left is the internal hernia and doing a diagnostic laparoscopy if you see do not see any herniation of the bowel but you see open hernial defect it means the diagnosis was internal hernia and it is imperative that you close those defects at the time of diagnostic laparoscopy and we have seen that they these patients they get relief from their pain so it is important to do a elective diagnostic laparoscopy in these patients of pain abdomen after rygb thank you sir you have most very nicely explained the internal hernias thank you thank you thank you dr ramesh and thank you whole team for conducting such a wonderful webinar thank you that was a very exhaustively explained uh, internal hernia topic uh, we now move to the next topic of uh, spigelin hernia and other interparietal hernia dr imri amil would be filling in for dr danny rosen and uh, dr harbeep paul singh would be uh, chairing the session we have dr danny here oh fantastic yeah, I, I, so we have both both of, we have both both the people here very nice yeah i will just introduce dr imri is a young and bright surgeon right. very enthusiastic about hernia surgery and is one of the leaders in Israel in surgical simulation and education and please Imre play your part okay thank you uh, hello everybody uh, thanks for having me uh, my name is Imre Amiel I'm a surgeon from Israel and uh, in the next 15 minutes I'll be talking about spigelin hernia um so the semilunar line was first described by Edwin van der Spiegel, a 17th century anatomist of Flemish origin, a lecturer in the University of Padova, Italy. Yet the first description of a hernia through this area was documented only in 1764, more than a century after his writings were published. Um, each semilunar line extends as a curved line just lateral to the border of the rectus abdominis muscle from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage to the pubic spine. Uh, anteriorly, in its whole length, it is reinforced by the internal oblique, uh, uh, by the external oblique, sorry, and posteriorly for three quarters of the way from the above downwards, it is reinforced by, this, by the transversus abdominis. As more and more fibers are joined uh, to the anterior sheath, the posterior sheath becomes thinner and finally end midway between the pubis, between the umbilicus and the pubis, creating the semicircular or arcuate line of Douglas. 
The linear semilunar naris or the semilunar line of Spiegel is not a mere line. Repeated dissection and surgical obs observation during the years have proved that the blending of the muscle layers uh, and the panorotic sheath uh, is not accomplished through a sudden sharp line of demarcation, but rather through a broad zone extending to a variable distance from three to 37 millimeters in width. Spigillian hernias are usually located at the junction of the arcuate line and the semilunar line in the Spigillian fascia, where the fascia is at its widest portion. However, the exact location of the arcuate line is variable, uh, which give rise to the concept of the Spigillian hernia belt, located between the horizontal lines drawn just below the umbilicus cranially and the anterior superior ilex spines caudally, and is usually about six centimeters in length. The symptoms of small hernias are often obscure and the diagnosis is difficult. This is especially true in cases where the hernia does not perforate the external oblique and thus is interparietal in nature. Most patients complain of localized pain or discomfort at the site of hernia protrusion. Only as the hernia enlarges or perforates the external oblique to become subcutaneous in position, the patient will notice a bulge, which will also be palpable during physical examination. According to the literature, the report incidence of Spigelin hernia ranges from 0.1 to 2% with slight predominance in women. These hernias are generally small in diameter with a defect typically typically measuring one to two centimeters. They tend to develop during the fourth to seventh decade of life and up to 20% will have an acute presentation with bowel obstruction. Cross-sectional imaging or ultrasonography can be helpful in the diagnosis of hernia for patients with localized pain in the spigillian belt and no palpable mass. As seen on the left side of the screen, a uh, CAT scan shows intraperitoneal fat bulging just lateral to the right rectus muscle covered by the external oblique aponeurosis. On the right side of the screen, a magnetic resonance view uh, um, shows a different uh, patient with a similar presentation. Keep in mind that the fat is now depicted in white and the muscles and fascia in black. According to the literature, because of high risk of incarceration, watchful waiting is not recommended when spigillin hernia is found incidentally. Although surgeons may have different experience and we rarely see this acute presentation. The initial step in an open repair is to confirm the location of the hernia. This can be challenging if the hernia is not palpable by hand. However, modern imaging techniques can overcome this challenge. After the skin is being marked by, with ultrasound guidance, a transverse or an oblique incision is made and the subcutaneous tissue is explored if the hernia uh, penetrates the external oblique aponeurosis or if interparietal in nature, an incision of the fascia of the external oblique is made. The sac can then be excised uh, or reduced into the abdominal cavity. If there's concern to the visceral content of the hernia, the sac uh, should be open to allow its inspection. Following uh, a primary repair uh, of the separated transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscles can be accomplished with either running or uh, interrupted sutures, as only rarely Recurrence has been documented in the past, even before the era of prosthetic mesh. Nowadays, most surgeons, most surgeons uh, would prefer to reinforce uh, the repair with a mesh. A flat sheet of prosthetic mesh can be placed either between the repaired internal oblique muscle and the external oblique, or in a pre-dissected preperitoneal space. The mesh is then secured 
with sutures or tacks placed circumferentially around the prosthesis. If the preperitoneal uh, space has been dissected widely enough to allow large overlap uh, of the defect, uh, then no fixation is required. Once the prosthesis is in place, and the above muscle layers are reapproximated, as in the non-prosthetic technique. And finally, the external oblique aponeurosis and uh, is, is uh, being sutured and followed by skin closure. Today, laparoscopic approach simplifies the repair in both the identification of the hernia site from within the abdomen the placement of the mesh, and the results of the surgery. This can be achieved in different techniques. One is the IPON technique, with or without primary transfacial sutures, the extended view, totally extraperitoneal re uh, repair, and the transabdominal preperitoneal repair. This movie depicts the case of a 57-year-old female with past medical history of inflammatory bowel disease and a body mass index of 23.4, who presented to the emergency department in our institution in the beginning of this year, complaining of abdominal pain with a discrete bulge in her lower right abdomen with no clinical evidence of bowel obstruction. Her physical exam revealed a small, tender palpable mass in a right lower quadrant of the abdominal wall without peritonitis. Her CAT scan showed what seemed to be a, a right-sided spaghetti hernia with incarcerated fat. She was then taken to the operating room. The operation begins with the inspection of the peritoneal cavity, identification of the hernia defect, and extraction of the omentum from the hernia sac using laparoscopic forceps and harmonic scalpel. As you can see, there was quite a lot of momentum, uh, which was uh, inside the hernia sac. Once the sac content has been reduced, a peritoneal flap is open immediately to the defect and uh, widen sideways to accommodate a large enough mesh. Please pay attention to the arcuate line as it, as it is being revealed in the upper left side of the screen. The hernia sac is then separated from the fascial defect. The defect is then closed in a primary fashion using a polycropylene suture passed transfacially using an endoclose suture passer. An eight centimeters wide, lightweight polypropylene mesh is then adhered to the fascia using absorbable tacks.
Finally, the peritoneal flap is closed over the mesh using tacks. That's all. Uh, thank you all for listening and warm regards from uh, the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel. Dr. Emil? Dr. Emil? Dr. Emil, can you hear me? Dr. Imri? Yeah. Dr. Emil, can you hear me? Dr. Harmi is uh, asking if you can hear him. Is he audible to you? Sir, I don't think so. No. Uh, Doctor, Doctor Imri. Emil. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Uh, nice, very nice presentation. Congratulations for that. Uh, I have one observation and one question. Observation is that to my younger colleagues, to have a high index of suspicion because any pain, localized pain in that area, and any small lump. Please have a high index suspicion. Otherwise, you are liable to miss this interpretal <clears throat> hernia, and they are very liable to obstruction and strangulation. My question to ML is: uh, any predisposing factors for such hernias, and any surgery which predisposes to such hernias? Doctor ML, can you repeat the question, sir? And any predisposing factors for such hernias to occur or any su previous surgery which can predispose to such hernias? Uh, the current case, uh, she had an open small bowel resection uh, many years ago in a midline incision, um, which had uh, apparently no connection to the spigillin hernia. I think we should also uh, recognize that some of these so-called spigelian hernias, actually trochocyte hernias, because this is quite a common place to, to place trochocytes, and some of them are large yes. and not... That was what by us, some studies have reported high incidence of these hernias post laparoscopic surgeries. Right. So we have no questions as such from the doc-lexus side, the audience side. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Harmeet, can we, in that case, move to the next segment? Uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, now we move to the last leg of the session today. And uh, I hereby invite uh, Dr. Uh, Parth Sarthi as a speaker and Dr. Atul Agarwal as the chairperson for the topic of CT anatomy and management of primary lumbar hernias. Uh, Dr. Parth Sarthi, over to you, please. Uh, very good evening to all. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the President and the Secretary and Office Bearer of uh, HSI, uh, HSI and uh, Dr. Fallavi and Dr. Vishal uh, to giving me this opportunity. And uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to talk on today. It's a, one of the very rare hernias. Uh, it is called a lumbar hernia. And I'm going to show you CT anatomy and then a laparoscopic management of lumbar hernia. I'm going to share my screen. So this is the CT anatomy of uh, lumbar hernia. So usually we you know we are very well versed with the ventral hernia. Uh, all type of you no know, midline and uh, lateral uh, ventral hernias, and uh, this comes under the category of uh, dorsal hernias, and this is the hernia occurs between the uh, inferior, you uh, know, inferior to the twelfth rib, and superior to the iliac crest. So this is the reason, uh, this is the region the hernia is occurring. Uh, so this is called dorsal hernia, and this is an unusual hernia. And it accounts for around 1.5 to 2 percent of abdominal wall hernias. And nowadays we are uh, seeing frequently 
uh, lumbar hernias uh, because the uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon started doing anterior fusion of lumbar spine in a lumbar approach and then uh, after radical nephrectomies and uh, transplant surgeries so the lumbar hernias is you know coming more and uh, it represents as a pseudo hernia also in my series a lot of pseudo hernias and uh, this is because of the lateral bulge the result of intercostal nerve injury t11 and t12 and the subsequent paralysis of the flat muscle it will produce a huge hernia and it's called pseudo hernia there will not be any obstruction but it is pseudo hernia and these generally these hernias are very difficult to treat and way back in uh, 17th century the first report of uh, strangulated lumbar hernia came by uh, robert tun and uh, in petit john louis petit uh, in 1783 and he described the lum inferior lumbar space otherwise called inferior lumbar triangle and in the 17th century and in 1866 grinfeld described the superior lumbar space and a lot of you uh, know description came uh, for traumatic acquired lumbar hernias uh, for the first time laparoscopic approach of lumbar hernias described by burick and uh, parascandolo in 1996 that is the first report of lumbar hernia that is also traumatic uh, lumbar hernia before going for the ct anatomy this is a illust illustrated picture of a uh, uh, superior lumbar uh, triangle uh, is shown in this picture so we got to you know find out uh, three important structure uh, one is the 12th rib 12th rib and uh, erector spinae muscle and the and internal oblique muscle so this 12th rib will be the superior border and then erector erector spinae it will be posterior and the internal oblique will be the anterior so this is the three muscle is forming the triangle usually the transverse abdominis uh, form the apex of the uh, floor of the triangle and uh, usually this triangle in uh, seen in 85% of the one study shows it is only 80 82% of the patient uh, humans the triangle is described in a cadaveric study so when we are going for a ct to look out the superior lumbar area so we have to concentrate on the 12th rib and the erector spinae muscle and the internal oblique muscle so this is the three identification point uh, of this uh, ct findings so now i am going for a ct findings of the lumbar hernia thanks to dr pallavi to share this uh, ct video and this is the video from uh, dr david uh, lori from uh, pasadena california and this is one of the very good uh, description i could see and uh, so this is the dorsal hernia basically so we are seeing the back side of the patient and the entire back is mostly is covered with the latissimus dorsi muscle and it was uh, shown in this picture as a yellow color and then this is the uh, purple will be the external oblique and then blue will be the internal oblique once you cut this dorsal it is superior triangle is basically covered with the latissimus latissimus dorsi muscle and once it zoom that area so this is the 12th rib and then Uh, this is some of the fibers of serratus anterior muscle and then uh, according to dr Le david lorey and quadratus lumborum is the main thing to identify in superior and inferior lumbar triangle but it is not uh, uh, no described in uh, many literature so this is a green color this erector spinae this is the internal oblique in blue color is marked and then purple will be the external oblique so we are concentrating on 12th rib uh, erector spinae and the internal oblique so this is the superior triangle it is covered with the latissimus dorsi and uh, i am going to show the ct anatomy of the uh, superior triangle now and you can see this is the erector spinae muscle on both side and this is the quadratus lumbar it is marked in uh, uh, brown color here this is the 12th rib and then this is the latissimus uh, dorsi so now this is the triangle so now this is the you know, coronal view and you get able to see this uh, quadratus lumborum here and then this is the 12th rib and then this is the latissimus dorsi so this is the superior triangle so we are not uh, concentrating uh, we are on uh, ventral side and then a flank uh, muscle but this is little posterior anatomy so in this case it is a uh, suppose superior lumbar hernia is present it is it will be seen like this 
So now you can see this uh, now trace, tracing the rib. And this is the tip of the 12th rib. This is the erector spinae. And this is the quadratus lumborum. And uh, this is the lattice mesh. This is a normal side. You can see the lattice mesh dorsi will be like this. And then this is the hernial side. And uh, this is the lattice mesh dorsi. So it is called uh, no ballooning of lattice mesh dorsi. It is called lattice mesh dorsi ballooning sign. And this is the erector spinae muscle and the quadratus lumborum. And this is the lattice mesh dorsi. So this is the, the colon. No descending colon is coming into the and the adding fat is coming through the hernia. So this is the coronal view. And again, 12th tip is seen here. This is the quadratus lumborum. And this is the lat muscle. And this is the hernial side. So this is the normal uh, area or normal uh, triangle. This is the lumbar hernia. This is the superior lumbar hernia. Going to the inferior lumbar uh, triangle, otherwise called a petit uh, triangle. And here, the anatomical boundaries is uh, lattice mus dorsi and uh, external oblique muscle and the iliac crest and the iliac crest so this iliac crest here it is the internal oblique from the uh, floor of the triangle internal oblique will be the floor of the triangle and here uh, again i'm going for a ct anatomy so this is the inferior lumbar triangle we have to concentrate on iliac crest and the external oblique and internal oblique the three muscles you have to concentrate here and this patient had a hernia here and we are well versed about this ventral anatomy and then the lateral flat muscles, uh, transverse subdominus, internal oblique, and external oblique seen nicely. And uh, so these are all the triangle, inferior triangle, uh, lumbar triangle. So this is the area. And this is the thin area connected. You know, it is the uh, iliac crest. And uh, external oblique will be purple color. And then uh, uh, this is the lattice must dorsi. You can see it is a covering back, entire back. And then this is the internal oblique will be marked here with a blue color. So this is the thin you know, upper neurotic area will be connected. So this is the internal oblique. If this uh, internal oblique is uh, ruptured, then this will form a hernia. So here also the quadratus lumborum is there. And uh, so according to him, Dr. David, uh, quadratus is the important structure to identify uh, in all both uh, superior and inferior lumbar hernia. Again, the coronal view, uh, this is the external oblique muscle. And you can see the iliac crest here. This is the internal oblique. Color is marked as a blue. And then here, the part of you no know, small uh, quadratus, quadratus lumbar muscle is also seen here. So this is the internal oblique area, inferior triangle, uh, inferior lumbar triangle area. This is another view. Iliac crest is seen, sagittal view. And uh, this is the rib. And then this is the internal oblique. And then this is the lattice mus dorsi muscle. And this is the sum of some external oblique also seen here. So it is very, after this, uh, now we can able to find out very easily. Suppose if it is the lumbar hernia is there. So how the anatomy is changed. Again, axial view, quadratus lumborum on both sides, lats, and then external oblique. And then now you can see here, the internal oblique is disrupted here and then this is the erector spinae this is the lat muscle quadratus lumborum and external oblique so this is the inferior uh, no petit uh, hernia inferior lumbar hernia here you can see it is uh, no well covered here all the muscles usually the colon and the extra brittle pad of fat of tissue will be the content so this is the ct view of uh, identifying the inferior uh, lumbar uh, hernia and triangle and then uh, superior lumbar hernia and the triangle so again, the uh, external oblique uh, muscle and iliac crest. And then this side, this patient had all here, the sagittal coronal view is a lumbar hernia presence. So coming to the laparoscopic management, and this is the team setup uh, for a left side uh, a lumbar hernia, uh, maybe superior or inferior. And usually we keep the patient in left lateral with the sandbag below here, the surgeon stand on the right side, and uh, monitor will be on the left, uh, left side of the patient and uh, assistant will be on the left, left side of the surgeon. We used to make a three port in the midline, and then we could enter. So this is the midline port, 10 mm camera and 5 mm, a working port on either side. So the triangulation is, uh, you know, will be there for a good for suturing. And sometimes we put an extra port here. And uh, we have to concentrate, uh, you know, uh, we have to mobilize the colon and uh, sac to be mobilized. 
So initially, the intraoperative adhesions to be dissected first. Then we'll expose the hernial and its contents, and the sac to be contents to be reduced, sac to be excised, the facial edge to be cleared, and then we do closer of the defect. And sometimes, you no, know, if it is uh, difficult to close it, then we keep a large mesh. The mesh to covers almost seven to you no know, ten centimeter all around, and usually it will cover the costal margin to the iliac crest, and then uh, soleus muscle to the anterior abdominal wall. So, so such a large mesh we require. Usually we keep a composite mesh, and then we fix it with the suturing, intracarpal suturing, and take up both. So this is the left lumbar hernia. The patient is in left lateral decubitus position. Bowel is being displaced, and then the adhesion is there on that side, and there is a colon until we are not reaching the hernial site. And now it is a hernial site is being seen. So we try to reduce the content of the hernia, and usually it will be asymptomatic for a long time, and if it is a bigger the defect, is bigger. So uh, we were pushing from outside. Uh, we could be able to reduce some of the content, and then we started uh, dividing the uh, you no know, lateral attachment of the colon line up. Colon it is being dissected, and we have to mobilize the colon uh, medially, and uh, we have to expose the uh, soleus muscle, and we have to come up to the quadratus lumbar muscle. So now this is the spleen uh, we dissected up the costal margin dissected. Now uh, we could see a lot of content. And this is the only the peritoneal attachment, just a lateral peritoneal fold. I'm, I'm dividing now, and so that it will give a good view to take out the content. We tried with the with this view, the camera is going inside to take out the content. We find difficult, so that is the colon is still there. So maybe the congenital type. So I'm you know we are just avoid avoiding the opening. now it is uh, camera is taken into the defect and uh, we could able to reduce the sac and if you find out if you reduce the sac the content will come out no need to separate take the colon separate and then take sac separate because nothing else is there only the sac if you take out the sac the entire content will come out so now we are uh, no uh, entire sac is being taken out so now the uh, inferior muscle is being in the view And this is the inferior part of spleen, so we are going into the costal uh, margin area uh, posteriorly, and superiorly we go onto that level, and then we mobilize the colon completely. We expose the entire uh, soleus muscle. And when we come down, we have to careful about the pelvic nerves and the ureter and the gonadal vessels, and sometimes the iliac vessel to be taken care. So this the ureter is being identified, and then uh, uh, all the attachment lateral. Uh, Attachment is being released, so we need to keep a larger mesh. And uh, see, this is the ureter. Ureter is down. That is the ureter. That is the soleus muscle, and the gonadal vessels is also being separated. So we exposed. Uh, now we push the colon medially, and we expose the quadratus lumbar muscle. So this is the defect. It is difficult to suture the defect. Now you can see almost 10 centimeter all around the defect is being uh, uh, mobilized. And this is that uh, large mess, uh, composite mess. This is the uh, metronic, uh, no, covidian mess. It's a paratex polyester with the collagen film covering mess. And we used to take a transfacial suture, two or three minimum, and then it is being taken out. Our preference is intracarpal suturing, and for any lateral wall hernias or flank hernias, uh, very difficult to positioning the mess in the initial period. So we, you know, transfacial suture and then taker is ideal one. Uh, we fire the taker and in between uh, we suture also. Usually this is the uh, no secure strap. 25 pin will be there. So no anchor, 25 pin, and then three transfacial suture is already taken, and then multiple intracarpal suturing is also being done. So the idea is, uh, no, if it is a defect closer is possible, we can be able to close the defect. And most of the primary hernias is difficult to close the defect. If it is acquired hernia, traumatic or, or paralyzed muscle, uh, so that it is easy to close, and uh, primary hernia is difficult. So we used to keep large mesh, almost ten centimeter, covering all around should be there. So again, the colon is being repositioned, and then this end, uh, this ends the procedure. So this is another case. Uh, this is the traumatic one, 
and uh, uh, this is the drain site, you know, flank. You can see this is the iliac crest just above the iliac crest. It, it was there. And then in this case, uh, uh, ETEP, uh, ETEP is being uh, done. And uh, our approach is we go through the, we reach the sublay space with the optive view trocar. And this is a uh, nicely entered the sublay space, superior rectus muscle and the post rectus is down. And all the attachment is being divided. And after that, we put a two other port uh, you know, for our king. So this will give a you know, uh, almost 60 to 70 degree angle, so suturing and then this fixes in this idea. So here uh, uh, lateral uh, linear semilunaris is released and then TA muscle is exposed. I'm going to fast forward uh, you know, for a want of time. And uh, so now the TA muscle is being seen nicely and it, it required a tar uh, so that uh, tar and poster component separation now the tar is being done and uh, TA muscle is pushed up. So this is the you know, posterior component separation is being done. Again, tar is continuing you know, uh, to the costal margin towards up. And then now we are uh, you know, reaching the site, site of the uh, hernia. The site of the hernia is reached. Now we are taking out the content. Here also the same, the sac to be excised. And then content will be come along with the sac. The same principles. And uh, so now, uh, almost partly, it is reduced. So now it's completely the content and the sac is being taken down. And most of the time, the acquired are traumatic hernia. And it will able to be able to suture it. Uh, the paralyzed muscle will be there. And otherwise, this is called the pseudo hernias. Eh? This is the common, you know, nowadays we are getting a lot of uh, pseudo hernias, lumbar, you know, chromatic, uh, acquired uh, lumbar hernias. So this is the psoas muscle, uh, you know, it's exposed, they mobilize the content medially. So we should keep around, uh, you know, 10 centimeter covering all around. So the, here uh, we use the uh, PPT suture, a polybutester uh, locking V-lock suture, uh, number one size. and. Uh, so e tape uh, like uh, no, this is a very good suture, locking one non-observable. Even though it looks big defect, it is easy to approximate. So it's completely defect is being closed, and then large mesh polypropylene mesh is being kept. And you can see it is it should covers almost no uh, below the iliac crest level uh, and above at, at the costal margin level. And then you can see it's covering up to the quadratus lumborum area. So this, that is the center of the mesh. We're fixing at the level of the defect. And here, uh, uh, to uh, minimum three, four intracarpal suturing is enough. And then it's being uh, drain is kept, and then it is done. And we are seeing a lot of uh, you no know, paralyzed uh, muscle due to that uh, T11, T12 injury. And here, the pseudo hernia, the lot of you know, very high rate of failures. And uh, some author advised sandwich repair, that is the open uh, mesh repair and then laparoscopic uh, eye palm. So combined both you know, mesh repair is required to prevent the recurrence. This is one of the case, and the patient had a trauma. And then you can see very large one from costal margin to the pubic crest. And uh, uh, this is the, again, we did a eye, eye palm. This, in this case, we did the intra. Uh, no, on the uh, laparoscopic eye palm, and uh, you could see laparoscopically huge uh, no defect. This is the liver, the entire colon, uh, right side colon is within the defect. This is the cecum, small bowel, and then we again we take out the sac, we reduce the content. And uh, by since it is a very uh, flappy muscle, uh, we just uh, take out the skin. So we did have uh, open and uh, the flank, and then we suture the defect. We, uh, Cut the excess, uh, excess skin is being trimmed out. And then the after suturing, it will be like this inside. And then large mesh. Mostly this kind of uh, hernias will require 30 by 20 centimeter composite mesh. Again, this is the paratex mesh, 30 by 20 centimeter. And we fix it with the uh, anchor, secure strap, and then intracarpal suturing. So, uh, uh, dear my moderator, I'd like to conclude the lumbar hernia is a rare entity but it can be treated successfully by laparoscopic method. And intraoperatively, the mesh to be placed to cover wide coverage of the hernial defect. And if you're not closing the defect, it should cover 10 centimeter all around. And if you're able to close the defect, five centimeter is enough. 
and uh, mostly it will stretching out from the costal margin to the iliac crest and the anterior, anterior abdomen that is erectus to the uh, psoas muscle or erectus spinae muscle the thorough anatomical awareness of the flank region is very very important to avoid the damage to the important structures such as the ureter pelvic nerves and the gonadal vessel and other important vascular structure the ct anatomy and we are not uh, no much interpreted with the ct anatomy but if you know this a uh, three identification you no know, structure for each uh, triangle so we could able to identify the uh, hernia easily and then it will give a uh, no very good uh, no thorough uh, uh, information when we are going for a laparoscopic approach so uh, laparoscopic repair is a favored due to the reduction of morbidity and length of stay so it can be done successfully for a uh, lumbar hernia with this i'll finish thank you so much thank you thank you very much part sir uh dr adul uh, sir over to you uh, what would be your remarks on the same yeah it's very very interesting and the anatomy shown was really very nice especially the ct images uh, one question uh, basically in the anatomy of the superior triangle you showed the one of the boundaries is 12th rib for that anatomy of the lower triangle the one of the boundaries was iliac crest the pettis triangle and the above one so yeah. when you are putting the mesh you said to cover from the 12th rib to the iliac crest as far as the hernia principles go it should be beyond that so how do we deal with that problem because as for the anatomy of the uh, hernia itself the defect itself should be basically the one of the borders for the superior triangle is 12th rib so if we cover from 12th rib to iliac crest we are not be going beyond the boundary so that's why but i wanted to know how do you deal with that so in the video i showed you the spleen is mobilized you know medially the mesh is going almost you know above the level almost in the costal margin almost uh, not, not at the costal margin it's going above so we have to cover you know the one or two centimeters so above the up to the side. diaphragm basically cover the a bit of the diaphragm as well yeah yeah almost upper superior to the a pelvic brim as well beyond the the iliac crest itself yes yes that's why we are uh, looking for the ureter and the external iliac vessel and the gonadal vessel Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it is covering both the triangle, and uh, 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 in my say, in our series in gym, uh, the primary hernias are a little rare. Uh, we are not getting much, but uh, the acquired hernias we are getting more. Very interesting. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, sir, I have one question uh, to the speaker and to the chairperson here, uh, both of you. Uh, uh, we now are coming across uh, hernias from the sites where the bone has been harvested, uh, iliac crest, like orthopedic interventions. Um, any comment or any insight into the same of how the management differ, or it will be the same? But it is the same. It is the same. and the only thing uh, you have to go inferiorly more inferiorly more okay uh, what about closure of the defect or uh, even attempting it yeah if it is a uh, uh, it, it is called no due to the surgery it comes means you no know, some part of nerve injury also will be there so it is easy to suture or sometimes if it is a defect is bigger we can inject the uh, uh, botox uh, injection it will paralyze the muscle then you can attempt the suturing of the defect it can be done okay. by open method it, it is here hybrid technique is very well acceptable you can go for a, a open closer of the sac open excision of the sac and closer of the defect and then laparoscopy that is very well accepted in uh, flank hernia okay i have okay. one okay. comment okay. i have one comment regarding these uh, all these uh, rare hernias uh, i think the common denominator is that as surgeons we are very lucky to live nowadays because i think there are two factors that really help us and uh, really change the scene from what we used to do 20 or 30 years ago one is imaging and the second is laparoscopy i think with imaging we hope we can diagnose most of these uh, rare hernias which are really obscure and small and with laparoscopy we can access them and without the need to go through a major muscles and uh, large openings because most of them except for may maybe the humongous uh, lumbar hernias with the denervation can be very challenging most of them are quite small and bothersome and can be dangerous and uh, with laparoscopy you have good access and very good 
modes of repair, and I think that's why we are lucky. Yeah. Um, uh, sir, allow me to ask a question from Dr. Ashwin Tangavelu. Uh, this is for Dr. Partha Sarthi. Uh, instead of doing the ETA repair from the retro rectus space, wouldn't it be better to put the ports lateral to the linea semilunaris and do the same repair and avoid a tar? See, it is the coverage. Now we have to cover the mesh to the anteriorly also. It should be covered nicely. And if you go there, uh, posterior, uh, lay, uh, posterior to the defect, we can uh, dissect easily. The anterior coverage will be difficult. Uh, so we need to cover the defect all around, the hernia all around. So that's why I thought I thought it is a, a poster component and then uh, you know a tar with the poster component. A wider, yeah, a wider plane. Yeah. Um, now there so, are a few more questions. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. One question I have: Can you put the tackles in the quadratus lumborum without any hard? Yeah, usually uh, we we don't uh, you know fire the taker on the uh, psoas muscle and lumborum. Only that you know uh, 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 we try to suture that. Uh, Area. Any muscle is there, I try to suture it because suture will fold nicely better than the taker. Usually, the flat muscle, uh, no, uh, uh, oblique muscle, we can able to fire a taker. When you go retro peritoneum, quarters, lumborum, or a psoas muscle, my advice is for a suturing intracardial system. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a question regarding internal hernias. Uh, can suturing of the serosa? To, of the distal elementary limb to the abdomen wall, paralytalizing it basically, might stop the uh, hernia formation. This question is asked by Dr. Abhishek Singh. So, uh, paralytalization of the bowel to prevent the hernia. Any comment from anyone, please? Uh, if I can uh, re relate to that, I don't think that uh, suturing the bowel to the peritoneum uh, can last for long because the bowel is moving all the time. So I think we should concentrate on the holes them, themselves and close the holes and just fixing the bowel will not last. Perfect. Point taken. Uh, there is another question. Uh, are there any guidelines for treatment for salvage of mesh infection in ventral hernia repair? A very broad uh, question actually. Uh, maybe a short answer by any of the uh, Speakers or the chairpersons present, please. Dr. Ramesh, a short comment. Sir, you're muted. Can you get, give me the question again, Vishal? Yes. So, are there, uh, one of the uh, viewers has asked, are there any guidelines for treatment or salvage of mesh infection in ventral hernia repair? Oh, Very broad question. The first thing is you have to prevent. That's the biggest thing. Yes. So yes. Prevention is the biggest thing. You should see that it should never happen. And as we've had in our previous talks also that, you know, it should be the first case on the list. Change glove. Don't let the mesh come in contact with the skin. So these are all things which we need to follow. But in case you have a mesh infection, then what you're going to look at is you have to look at, you know, you have to get a CT scan done, send the swabs. To give antibiotics, try cons uh, yeah, palliative measures where you can conserve the mesh. And if they all fail, then you have to take out the mesh. And depending on, you can take it out by open surgery or by laparoscopic surgery. If you can do it by laparoscopic surgery, it's better because if the uh, hernia recurs, then you have intact planes there to uh, you know repair the hernia again. But if you've gone through the open uh, approach, then you don't have those planes to repair again. So it's a very broad topic, and I think in the previous webinars we have cropped, uh, you know, we've uh, tackled it very extensively. But this, that is in short, what we can do about mesh infection. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir, so much for that answer. There is another question, a little offbeat from the topic today. Um, the question is: Is the use of mesh reinforcement necessary for giant hiatal hernia surgery? So, uh, not another topic for the night, but I think so. Uh, maybe a line or two. Dr. Yusuf, you're smiling. I think so. You want to you want to say something? Again, a very debatable topic, and it's a very broad topic. Yes. And, uh, Two line answer. Yes. For small hernia, large, large, 
yeah large giant hydrolernia so it is uh, again not a consensus and uh, there are people in pro that we should put her, uh, mesh and there are groups that say that they should not be put so i think there is no clear consensus okay okay point taken um, i have one one question it, it's open to house uh, when you are operating one particular hernia be it uh, a groin hernia for example and you have discovered that the patient has an obturator or a femoral hernia would you put another code of surgery or you would just go with the same thing that you already done because effectively the mesh is covering everything uh, what is your take or what does the house say please see the, can i come in see please please case, sir, please uh, the treatment is same as you rightly said now Correct. if you want to charge the patient more you can come and say the patient that you fix up to her nails so that is yes. the economical point of view but yes. see, the supreme court has said that if you have not discussed that treatment before and if you find something else and if it is mm -hmm. not life threatening and you fix it up then you might be liable in the court of law so you cannot repair something which is not life threatening if you have not taken prior permission so you know there are two sides of this so if you try to make money and if they take you to the court you are done so i think it's preferable that you don't overcharge the patient you just make a note that this was need this was seen and it was treated that's it and inform the patient that it was done and if you can add a word or two that i am not charging you extra for this procedure <laughs> he will keep on singing your praises outside that what a good surgeon he is he's done two surgeries in the cost of one and he may send you some more patients Right, right, right. I think that Please, the, yeah, just to comment on that, I think yes. that the basic principle of doing a groin hernia repair is covering the whole myopectineal orifice. So right. how can you, how can, how are you justified in charging something extra for what you you were you intended to do at the first first instance? Doesn't matter if he has okay. an obturator hernia or he has a femoral hernia or I, that that's different if he has an umbilical hernia because that 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 may be in some cases you might find sure. that there. Or you you may have it, but in a groin hernia, I don't think it is justified for us to do wh whatever you are intending to do in such a case because the the intent of surgery is covering the whole myopectineal orifice. So that I agree with you totally, but there are some salesperson in our uh, community also who would sell <laughs> anything on earth. And I think that I think we will not be giving a right message to them. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you shouldn't do it. So you know the thing is also it's not. ethical that is one yes. that is there and uh, if you try to do it you might be caught and you might be Absolutely. you know liable also so i don't think i agree with you siddharth totally makes make makes sense uh, dr siddharth thank you for the uh, nice ethical point you that you made uh, an offshoot to what dr ramesh said that uh, uh, it it so happened that we discovered like we we had a working diagnosis of some hernia and we find one more hernia indirect direct both for example and then when we put that on paper and then we treated we had some queries so these days before uh, the surgery what now i do is i always tell them that that area is known to have more than one hernia the surgery that i'll be doing covers all of them so if in post uh, operative period if i write that there was an indirect and direct or a femoral hernia seen and repaired please don't get alarmed at why the new thing cropped up so uh, now i take a consent for a groin uh, hernia repairs rather than an, just an indirect or a direct that way so we've changed the term a little bit and i think so maybe it will I, th i think that holds true in groin hernias when it comes to bilateral repairs also because a lot of times clinically you don't find a bilateral hernia but right. according to literature a large percentage of patients have a bilateral hernia even they have they have right. not been diagnosed be operatively so in our setup usually the uh, this is not uh, exactly in detail what we are searching is because we are already doing a whole coverage but we definitely tell the patient that if you find the hernia on the other side we would like to do it in the same sitting and we take a prior consent for the other side sense. also because uh, like we are doing a tapp or a tep then you might find a bilateral in one hernia and if there is a hernia then definitely uh, we would uh, take the patient's consent prior pre operatively makes sense makes sense uh okay any any other comment or question from uh, any of the delegates um if none then uh, with the uh, kind permission of our president
President, sir, can we conclude the session? Yes. So I'll just uh, add a few words, Vishal. Thank you yes, very sir. much for moderating the session so well. Yes, I'm sir. so grateful that you took over in such a short span of time. We have really missed Pallavi. Pallavi, she, she uh, you know, did everything, all the background work for this program. But unfortunately, there was uh, mishap uh, with a relative, so that was there. Thank you, Danny, Amir, Yusuf, and thank you, Siddharth, Ganesh, Vijay Mittal, Atul, Parthasarthi, Harmeet, Rajesh Kullar, and everybody else. I would like to place on record that this program came about because of the suggestion of our immediate past president, Dr. Sandeep Dhabe, who has been a very dynamic president. He was the president prior to me, and it was his suggestion that we should have a session of hernia. I never had this brainwave. It was the brainwave of our past president. I'm grateful to him. I hope he's hearing this, that this session came about because of him and this session is dedicated to him. We are very grateful to Dr. David also because Dr. David was very, he, would, would, he wanted to come on the program, but he had prior commitments. So he said that you can use my uh, presentation and he sent the presentation to be used. We are very, very grateful to him for allowing us to use his uh, presentation. And I would like to thank all the delegates and uh, also the DocsPlexus team, headed by Kritika and the others, for this excellent session. Thank you very much and a very, very good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. We've actually stuck very nice.